you know what, I haven't done one of these for a long time, haven't I? So maybe now is a good time to do one. A book review. And today I would like to talk to you about three books. And there is sort of, in my opinion, a common theme between these books. And it will become apparent what that is once I start talking about them. The first book I would like to mention is by Sir, or and he's in the House of Lords anyway, Robert Winston, and it's called Bad Ideas. There you go. Bad Ideas. Now this book is basically looking at some of our greatest inventions, some of our greatest scientific advances, through sort of a an honest looking glass and accepting, of course, that with every scientific advance that we've made, there have also been certain not so pleasant side effects. Now, of course, we can all think of, you know, very simple examples of, for example, the development of nuclear physics and how that, for example, led to the nuclear bomb and how that is certainly not a good thing. But Robert Winston takes this a few steps further and he goes and looks at some of our most cherished advances in human history. Things such as writing, for example, or farming. And he looks at it and says, like, okay, these of course have given us great benefits on the one hand, but on the other hand, things haven't always been so rosy in the garden. And it's a good way of looking at science and recognizing that while it has served us in one sense, it has progressed us in our knowledge, that knowledge comes with responsibility and we have to take the, the new power that we've, you know, gained by gaining all this knowledge, we have to take that seriously and we have to be serious about how that applies to the rest of the world. And that leads us into the next book, because in the next book we're seeing a very, very different outlook on humanity and the state we're in and where we're going. And the book in question is The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley. Now, if you have been listening in the last few years to all the predictions of doom and gloom about things such as global warming and the population explosion and the acidification of the oceans and so on and so forth. This will be a refreshing read. I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with everything that's being said in this book, but at least it is a break from the dire predictions and the, you know, almost the sense that we're getting these days from listening to the prognosticators and how they seem to think that we're on this headlong rush towards our extinction, basically, and the destruction of the planet. And Matt Ridley points out, not entirely without merit, I would add, that that is not necessarily where we're going and that history has shown time and time again that we human beings have a remarkable capacity of finding a way out of predicaments that we find ourselves in and that there is also there's quite a lot of reason to be optimistic about the future even about such things as global warming for example having said that the tone of the book may be a little bit over-optimistic and it may be a little bit over-reliant on making assumptions that we will, as we have in the past, we will find solutions to some of the problems we are facing. And almost to the point where you might think that Mr. Ridley is being a little bit complacent in his outlook on how to deal with the problems that we're facing today. And in order to balance that out, the 
third book I'm going to mention is The God Species, in which Mark Linus kind of builds on some of the things that Mr. Ridley is saying. He actually even mentions Matt Ridley's book in this book, so I would certainly suggest that if you're going to read these three books, the Robert Winston one can be read at any time. You can read it whenever you like, but I would certainly suggest that you read The Rational Optimist first and The God Species next, in that order, because The God Species refers to The Rational Optimist and criticizes it in certain points, elaborates it in other points, and agrees with it in other points. And what's most interesting is the areas in which there is overlap between the outlooks of these two, maybe even three people. There are a number of things that have been preached to us as gospel by, for example, the, the Green Lobby, the environmentalists. And they have been presented to us as if there can be no discussion about them. And perhaps it is time that we started looking at these with fresh eyes. For example, I think anybody sane would agree that we have to be at least aware of the fact that there is global warming going on at the moment. Now, how do we deal with it? That is where all three authors, I think, disagree with some of the proposed solutions by the environmental lobby. Because what a lot of people who claim to be environmentalists seem to be focusing on is on trying to persuade us, the human race, to effectively take a step back with regards to our wealth, with regards to our affluence, with regards to our, you know, um, mobility, our communications, and so on and so forth, it's like they are urging us to go back to some sort of mythical golden age in which we were living in some sort of harmony with our planet. And, as all three of these authors will point out, that is a pipe dream. That is something that cannot ever be achieved again. We are facing living on a planet with 7 billion people and growing and we have to somehow find a way of dealing with us living on this planet, our numbers still increasing even though population growth is now starting to slow down and hopefully will level off at a sustainable level, but we need to realize that some of the solutions proposed by environmentalists are simply never going to work. For example, some environmentalists declare that they are concerned with exploitation of the planet, of available resources, and then they are proposing that we should, for example, start farming organically. That is all lovely, and I love organic produce, myself. But the simple matter is that if we are going to go organic, and that means organic in the strictest sense of the word, which means relying on natural ways of fertilizing, for example, our planet can probably support about 1.5 billion people at a push. That would require us using every available inch of farmland, every available inch of land, of available land that could possibly be farmed on this planet. Think about what that means. First of all, how do such particular types of environmentalists propose that we're going to cull the six billion superfluous people on this planet? Because that is what it's going to boil down to. These people are either going to have to starve to death or are going to have to be forcibly eradicated from this planet. If we insist that we have to go organically farming. The only real solution to this problem 
is further intensification of farming. That is the only thing that can continue, continue to sustain the number of people that live on this planet. That is a realization that we have to accept. Also, what people need to realize is that intensification of farming does not necessarily have to be anti-environmental. And if you think about it, if we can find ways of intensifying our farming to get more yield out of a smaller amount of land, that means that other land can become available again to return to a natural wild state. That is good for biodiversity and that is good for the planet as a whole. Think outside the box. That is one of the messages that you can get from all three these books. That the simplistic linear thinking that is presented by environmentalists is not necessarily correct. Another example of this is nuclear energy. Environmentalists seem to have this bugbear about nuclear energy and that is something that needs to be stamped out because of course we're going to look into alternative ways of getting energy. We're going to look at renewables and so on and so forth. Wind energy, the energy from the sun, the energy from tidal forces. All of that needs to be harvested. But all of that together is not enough to sustain our energy needs. And again, the solution is not to try and bully people into becoming some sort of returning to some sort of frugal state of living in which we deny ourselves all sorts of luxuries and pleasures because nobody's going to buy that. That is the sort of coercive politics that is never going to work. The only solution is to add to all these renewable forms of energy also a large investment into nuclear energy as a source of energy that is much cleaner than, for example, coal or gas or petrol usage. Now people, again, environmentalists, like to scare us with stories about nuclear disasters. And again, you might want to look at this in a slightly different light. Look at Fukushima, for example. What is the death toll of Fukushima? Look at that. What is, and this is going to be very controversial, what is the official death toll of Chernobyl? Look it up. Now, don't get me wrong, Chernobyl was a terrible nuclear disaster. But if we are honest about this, if we look at the actual impact that this disaster has had on the environment, you'd be surprised. The total death toll of Chernobyl over the 30 or so years, since 25 years, since this disaster actually happened, is but a fraction of the death toll that we accumulate daily, no yearly anyway, on the effects of pollution and global warming due to the, f the use of fossil fuels. You need to compare the correct impacts with each other. Over 30 years, the effect of Chernobyl has been negligible with the effect that is still going on with continued pollution, continued burning of fossil fuels in places such as China, for example. That is the reality of the situation. Look at the environment around Chernobyl. Now I'll be the first one to accept that that area is not fit for human habitation. 
it is not safe to go and live there. I accept that. For human beings it isn't. Because we do not want the increased risk of contracting certain forms of cancer and so on and so forth. That is not something that we human beings are willing to accept. But if you think that the area around Chernobyl is a barren wasteland, you'd be sorely mistaken. Because thanks to the fact that human beings are no longer willing or able to live in the area, it has become a refuge for wildlife. It has become a little oasis of biodiversity. That is another legacy we have from Chernobyl. That horrible, the worst nuclear disaster in the history of nuclear physics. Think about those things. Think about it before you jump onto the bandwagon of environmental politics that are basically just coercive politics that try to force us back into a lifestyle that would be fitting for a medieval peasant and before you think give up absolutely everything in order to go for, move forward into the future. Some of these books are more realistic than others. I think Mr. Ridley is a little bit optimistic, over optimistic. I think Mr. Winston is probably scraping the barrel a little bit, trying to find the negative in the advances that we as a human race have made. I think Mr. Linus strikes a fairly good balance between being optimistic about the future and being realistic about the problems that we're facing and the problems that we need to tackle. And that's what I would like to leave it with.